Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, 1 to 10 is going to be our text this morning. And by way of reminder, since we covered uh, our PowerPoint verse last week, we found something interesting in chapter 18. It was a bit curious, and it, we used it as kind of a springboard to both our title and topic for the day. And what I'm talking about is what Acts 18, 18 to 21 recorded for us, where we're told that Paul still remained a good while in Ephesus. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him, and he had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And then he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you again, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And we will find him returning to Ephesus in our text this morning. But let me remind you that the feast that Paul said he had to get to Jerusalem to keep was the feast of Passover. The vow he had taken was the vow of a Nazarite, which was basically a commitment for a prescribed period of time to not cut one's hair, not to drink any wine, and not to go near a dead body. And at the end of that time, that commitment of time, the person who made the vow would then cut off their hair, take it to Jerusalem at the Passover, and offer it as a burnt offering in the midst of the rest of the sacrifices offered at that feast. Now, we made the point that the Nazarite vow was a Jewish tradition, and it was an effort to show one's complete consecration to God. Now, some commentators said that Paul was actually having trouble letting go of Judaism. Others said that Paul was actually displaying a bit of spiritual immaturity by feeling the need to keep this vow. Now, Paul, as we mentioned last time in Romans 14, 5 to 8, said one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in other people's minds. You would think that's what it said, the way people force traditions on one another today. And he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day, speaking of feast days, to the Lord does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, read it, please. We are the Lord's. Now, Paul wasn't having trouble freeing himself from Judaism, nor was Paul showing spiritual immaturity by committing himself to this vow. He was expressing his commitment and consecration to the Lord through a long-held tradition. Now, we also noted from 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23, where Paul would say, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became a what? A Jew that I might win Jews. To those under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now I do this for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul took this Nazarite vow for the gospel's sake. It wasn't because he couldn't let go of Judaism and its practices or because he wasn't completely spiritually mature. After all, think about it. Every city we visited with Paul, the first place he goes to, even though he's the apostle to the Gentiles, is to the synagogue of the Jews. Paul had a heart for his own countrymen, as he would often bear out in many of his epistles. And though some criticized Paul for this vow, what we did learn is that Paul didn't say, listen, if you're really spiritual, you'll take the Nazarite vow with me. He didn't impose his own traditions on other people, which taught us these three things. First of all, we learned that good traditions can become bad doctrine by making them requirements. 
We made the application and we can't say church has to be in this order. It has to be in this structure. Worship has to be in this style or it's not real worship or real church. Listen, there's lots of ways to express your love for God. And of course, they're all to be done decently and in order. But listen, you can worship with hymns. You can worship with uh, contemporary music. I suppose it's even possible to worship with country music, though I'm not sure about the last. I'm just kidding. I've got major country music fans in my house, so uh, country music is okay with some people. Now, <laughs> listen. <clears throat> we also learned that one tradition common among all Christians should be blessing others. And we heard about Apollos when he was shown a more excellent way. He was fully informed of the person and work of the Holy Spirit that when he arrived where he was sent, he became a blessing to others. And we also learned, and we'll unfold this a little bit more this morning, that every Christian should respect and honor the word of God. Somebody say, now, last time our message was titled The One Thing, and we looked at three things and made up the one thing. And the one thing that all three things were a part of is being born again through the body and blood of Christ, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. Now, our last chapter, as we pointed out, had caused some debate among commentators. Our, f- our first 10 verses of chapter 19 have moved beyond debate. They have caused downright division and even discord within the body of Christ. Now, and it's all because of one question that we're going to find in verse 2, where Paul says to a group of 12 men, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And their answer was, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now, There are two main camps regarding this question and why it was asked. And we're going to introduce a third possibility this morning, recognizing something that is very important. And that is when we are looking at a set of verses, we cannot isolate them from the rest of the text, nor can we practice what's called eisegesis and force our interpretation into the text. We have to let the text speak within the context of what we are reading, and that's what we're going to do this morning. Thank you for those two amens. I appreciate it. (laughs) Now, the two interpretations are this, and this is what the church has debated over and even fought over for centuries. One group says there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that is separate from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's even a subgroup of this group that believe that what this text tells us is that you can be saved, yet not even indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, what they're saying is the presence of the Spirit is separate from the moment of regeneration or being born again. And we'll talk more about these as we go. Now, the other group says there's no second blessing. There's no baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's just the giving of the Spirit as a guarantee of your future inheritance And what you're going to get, you get at the moment of regeneration or the moment you're born again. Now, what that means is this, and why it's important for us to study this from the position of doctrine, is if we take that position, that means the 12 men we'll meet this morning and Apollos, who we met a couple of weeks ago, were not saved. And they weren't saved until this moment in time or when they had the revelation that was given to them. Now, again, as I said, we're going to consider a third option this morning that is actually leading us to our title. And our title is simply this, and I'll explain it after I give it to you. Our title is To Be Continued. Uh, Not our title is To Be Continued, but our title is To Be Continued. That cleared up? Now, let me just express it like this. Philippians 1.6 says, To be confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until when? The day of Jesus Christ. Does that not imply an ongoing work in all of our lives? Is God still working on you? He's still working on me, that's for sure. I don't want to hear anything out of the front row either. He is still (laughs) working on me. I will openly confess that he's got quite a job to do as he continues to complete what he began in me until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to offer reasons why it is possible for there to be a third interpretation of what we're going to look at besides the two main camps. Now, we also need to recognize the general principle that's true for every Christian, and that is that God is still working on us, as we mentioned a moment ago. 
Because the truth is, nobody understands everything about the Bible the day they get saved. Nobody is ready for all the work that God wants to do them, do through them the moment they get saved. God is constantly equipping. That's the purpose of church, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, which implies there are things that we need to learn in order to do the work of ministry. So our course of action this morning is to hopefully clear up some of the murkiness concerning these verses and avoid all discord and division, which is something that God Hates. We don't want anything to do with that. Amen? So, would you stand and read with me, please, from Acts chapter 19, the opening 10 verses, and we'll learn that there are things that are to be continued. Verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the, withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannosaurus Rex. No, it's just Tyrannosaurus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And we thank you, Lord, for this text this morning. And we do ask your aid, Lord, both in the ears of the hearer and the tongue of the speaker, that we would glean that which the text is saying and not try and force anything into it. So keep us, we pray, within the context so we can take away what you have for us to know. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the first of our three considerations will come from the first of our three verses this morning, where arguments are established that these men were not Christians. They were not believers at all. And it begins with the fact that disciples does not imply one having been born again, which is true. The word disciple actually means a learner. Now, in John 8, 31, Jesus spoke to Jews who believed in him and he said, if you abide in my word, there's a condition, a point of identification. He said, you are my disciples indeed. Now then in John 6, 66, in the Bread of Life discourse, we're told after Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me, speaking figuratively and pointing to the elements of communion. From that time, many of his what? His disciples went back and walked with him no more. So they were learning from Jesus. They were learning about Jesus. But when he said something they couldn't wrap their brains around, they quit following Jesus and never walked with him again. So it is possible to be a disciple or a learner, yet not a born again believer. Now they continue their argument by saying every born again believer is going to have an awareness of the Holy Spirit and being ignorant of the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit shows that one is not born again. Now, we need some clarity concerning this statement. We have not heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And the clarification we need to arrive at is the understanding that these men were Jews. They were disciples of John the Baptist. They had been baptized into John's baptism of repentance. And therefore, John, like Jesus came preaching to the Jews first, so these men were Jews. And the important thing we need to recognize because of that is that the Old Testament is replete concerning the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit. David was certainly aware of the Holy Spirit, where he wrote in Psalm 51, 11, do not cast me away from your presence and take not your what? Your Holy Spirit from me. The Jews were well aware of the existence of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, this statement cannot be one 
of ignorance of existence, but rather ignorance about the receiving of the Holy Spirit in a form that was exclusive to the church age. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon the people whom God empowered, including the prophets. During the New Testament age, something exclusive only to the church is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is something they had never heard of before, as well as the baptism. Now, we need to remember something concerning the argument that these men were not yet saved based on their unawareness of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament sense of understanding. Now, in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, Jesus told his disciples in advance, the 120 who would be in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, he told them what was going to happen. He told them why it was going to happen. He told them where they needed to go once it happened. He told them they'd receive power. He told them the power was for the purpose of being witnesses and the direction for being witnesses started in Jerusalem, went to what is called now the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and then to the end of the earth, which I believe we can understand as both a time and a place. Now, I want you to think about this. We know what happened at Pentecost. Cloven tongues of fire settled on those who had gathered, and they began to speak in dialects learned through supernatural means instantaneously. Can you imagine if that happened to them without the advance notice Jesus gave them? Can you imagine the confusion, maybe even the fright that they would be experiencing? But the Lord said, the Spirit is going to come. Here's what He's going to do. Here's where you're going to go. So therefore... In my mind, ignorance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not demand the lack of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And these men say they were baptized into John's baptism, which we'll highlight in detail in a few moments. But let me also remind you of what Jesus said prior to his famous statement in Acts 1.8. In 4 and 5 of Acts 1, Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. In other words, I've been teaching you this all along. I've been telling you what's coming all along. And then he makes this point of distinction. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That tells us Acts 1-8 was not the first mention of the Holy Spirit by Jesus to his disciples. And then here he further clarifies there was a distinction between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus, that being the difference of water baptism and that of the Spirit. Now, two things to consider. For those who argue you can be saved and then later receive the Holy Spirit, they call this event another Pentecost. Well, it can't be another Pentecost because Pentecost was a feast of the Jews and it happened once a year, 50 days after the Passover, and it was fulfilled. And that feast, just like the three prior to it, were fulfilled by Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So rather than seeing this as a separate Pentecost, which didn't happen on the day of Pentecost, by the way, we need to rather recognize that there are anomalies in Scripture. Case in point, Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. That's a general truth for humankind. For every single birth, there is a single death. All people have an appointment with death. Are there exceptions in the Bible? There's two in the Old Testament, right? Enoch and Elijah, both were instantaneously, supernaturally translated into the heavenly realm in a moment and twinkling of an eye by the means of a supernatural agent. So we have that in the Old Testament. Let me also say, even though Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed unto men once to die, there's a whole generation of people who aren't going to die, but who are going to go to heaven when the trumpet blows and God translates them into his presence and they'll forever be with the Lord. So 
These are anomalies. And therefore, this is as well, in my view. This is not a second Pentecost. This is a group of 12 men who had heard the good news. They had believed in the one that John was preaching to them about. They received a guarantee of their future inheritance by the indwelling of the Spirit, but they had not yet received the empowering of the Holy Spirit because they wouldn't have known what to do with it. And now here they are under the oversight of the Apostle Paul, and they're ready to receive the power to be witnesses. Remember, they didn't have an Acts 1-8 to read. They didn't have a John 14 to read where Jesus went into explicit detail of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, first to convict the world of sin, then to call to remembrance the things that he had taught them, and then to teach them all things and enable them to do them according to his might and power. Now listen, they had no way of knowing about the baptism or the empowering aspect of the Spirit. All they knew was they needed to repent, and we'll talk more about that in a few moments. Now, this is why some would argue that it is impossible without the Holy Spirit to repent, and they would make that argument for their unsavedness. Now, these men were like Apollos. They didn't have the whole picture concerning the Holy Spirit. And like Apollos, they were lacking in their understanding of the third member of the triune Godhead. And like Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla, they were shown the whole of the picture this time through Paul. Now, I don't want to get overly dogmatic about this, but I'm just glad that we're right in our interpretation. No, it's just a possibility. And I think it offers a possible resolution instead of fighting with one another to simply arrive at what actually is in the text. Do you know, want to know what this text is telling us? In verses 1 through 3, you want to know the primary takeaway for us? Rather than fighting about a second blessing or baptism of the Spirit, Here's what's being taught. Here's what the Spirit would have us receive, I believe, today. is just this. Every Christian should be growing in the power of the Spirit and the knowledge of the Word. Every Christian should be growing in the power of the Spirit and the knowledge of the Word. In other words, our walk, our spiritual growth, and our biblical awareness is to be continued. It's to be a continual progression as the Lord empowers us and uses us. I like the way John MacArthur describes it. He says we're leaky vessels. Yes, we're filled with the Spirit, but we keep doing things that cause it to leak out through inattention or inactivity or simply disobedience, and we constantly need to be refilled by the Spirit of the living God. Aren't you glad He is an everlasting resource of power? He never has a reservoir that runs dry. Now, Think about what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. He said, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may what? Grow. Grow thereby. Grow from your study of the word, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And then he would write in his second epistle in chapter 3, 17 and 18, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, or this is well understood, Beware lest you fall, also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and forever. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Now, it's interesting that we read about growth from the apostle who needed to grow during the time of ministry with Jesus. Peter had a tendency to say things he hadn't thought of yet. And we see him often speaking out. He rebuked the Lord for saying that the Lord was going to die. And Peter went from his moment, his high point, when Jesus had posed the question at Caesarea Philippi, who do men say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter said, or the Lord said to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for you didn't learn this from men. My father taught that to you. And then the next thing we read that Jesus said to Peter was, get thee behind me, Satan. So Peter had kind of a, a roller coaster ride in his years of ministry with the Lord. And here he is saying, you know what? We need to study the word because it helps us grow. We need to grow in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has sent the Holy Spirit to us. We could add to that uh, promise of Jesus. Now, I don't think we need to see this group of men as either unsaved or uninhabited by the Holy Spirit. Their spiritual power and knowledge was to be continued, just like it's to be continued in you, just like it's to be continued in me. 
Let's take a second look at verses 4 to 7. <clears throat> then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now there were about 12 in <clears throat> all. Now, Paul does, as we mentioned, what Aquila and Priscilla did with Apollos. He fills in the blank of the missing parts of these men's understanding. He informs them that John's message was not to become John's disciple, but rather to become the disciple of the one John was not worthy to untie the sandal of, according to his own words. Now, it's noteworthy that the men were then baptized, even though they had been baptized by John. Now, some argue that this is proof that they weren't saved. I would say that this is, if we're going to pull anything out of the text, this would prove that you need to be baptized after you have a full understanding of what it means to follow Christ. And by the way, if you happen to be of a Catholic upbringing, infant baptism doesn't save anybody. It doesn't mean your kids are going to be saved. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward work. You publicly confess that you are dead to self and now alive in Christ Jesus. It's a conscious decision, not something forced upon an infant when they are sprinkled with water by a priest. Just in case you wanted to know that, I thought I'd share it. Now, this is the only recorded instance in Scripture of a re-baptism, men previously baptized. Now, there's an interesting component about this I want to highlight. Now, the fact that they're re-baptized makes a point and raises a question. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the people you like. Make disciples of who? All the nations. There's the end of the earth thing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, here's the point. The word for baptism in water and the word used for the baptism of the Holy Spirit are the same Greek word. It's baptizo or baptizo, however you choose to uh, pronounce it or put the emphasis on the syllable that you would like to choose. Now, that tells us there's nothing linguistically to distinguish between water baptism and the baptism of the Spirit. Therefore, we have to rely on context in order to determine what's being said. The context in our chapter is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts 1.5, remember, Jesus made the distinction saying, John baptized with water, but you, implying something different, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, some see here that they were water baptized and then they were baptized in the Spirit when Paul laid hands on them. Well, I submit to you this morning that it's very possible that there's only one baptism that takes place, and it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I say that for this reason. One, because it refutes the idea that they could not be saved and receive the power of the Holy Spirit unless they were water baptized first. Some today teach and believe you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And you'll find that in the book of Second Opinions with all the other nonsensical things that we uh, make mention of. Now, secondly, if these men were true yet uninformed believers, it dismisses the idea that all believers have to speak in tongues when they get saved, which is what is forced upon many today. And let me also add, it does not initiate the doctrine of the laying on of hands for the impartation of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. That was just a practice of Paul's, and it too would fall under that anomaly type category. Now, we see that this, though it is a Pentecost type experience, it's actually been recorded now four times in the book of Acts. First in Jerusalem on Pentecost, and then it spread to the Samaritans through Philip, and then to the Gentiles through Peter. And now we have the diaspora Jews having this experience through Paul who were living in Ephesus. 
Yet we also note that when Peter preached the first spirit-empowered message after Pentecost, being baptized in the spirit is not mentioned along with tongues and prophesying like we see in our text. As a matter of fact, back in Peter's sermon in Acts 2, 40 to 47, we're told him with many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Doesn't say anything about tongues and prophecy. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church, how often? Daily, those who were being saved. Now, these men were not Jews living in Jerusalem. They were Jews scattered to Asia Minor, living specifically in Ephesus. The power to be witnesses and the ability to speak in languages learned through supernatural means would be understandable if it was explained to them. And therefore, what we need to see and understand in this event, it's the Lord equipping for the work of ministry. They prophesied here. That doesn't mean they foretold the future. It means they uttered united praise for the Lord. Now, again, not trying to be overly dogmatic about this, but there is an undeniable and recognizable truth that we're going to see unfold if we read our verses again in sequence and context. And what we're being told here, secondly, in light of all the debate, in light of all the division, in light of all the discord, here's the for sure takeaway, and it's just this. Listen, repentance is essential to walking in power. Repentance is essential to walking in power. Now, while many would rather debate the issue as to what is meant in our verses, we can settle on the fact that John's baptism was not an illegitimate baptism. It was a water baptism practiced by the Jews. It wasn't illegitimate. It was incomplete. But we cannot ignore the progression here, remembering that baptism means to submerge or immerse completely. And from that, we can understand by the men's own declaration that they were baptized into John's baptism, that they were fully committed. They were submerged into what John was preaching. What was John preaching? Matthew 3, 1 to 3. Thank you for asking. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then we're told in Mark 1, 14 and 15, after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled in the kingdom of God is at hand, what do you say? Repent and believe in the... So repentance is part of the gospel message, according to Jesus. Now, John preached repentance, and after his arrest, Jesus preached repentance. And after Pentecost and his empowering, Peter preached repentance. As a matter of fact, Acts 2, 38 and 39 says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, what? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. In other words, this is what is going to happen throughout the whole of the church age. And please note, this wasn't a chronology that was being presented here. You'll be baptized and then it will happen. When you come to faith in Christ, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You receive gifts of the Spirit that you are to use for the glory of God and to reach other people with the gospel. And this is going to be true throughout the whole of the church age. In other words, it is to be continued. We see this same progression in our verses. The men say they've been baptized into repentance. And then they are baptized with the Holy Spirit, empowering them to be witnesses. 
Now, I think we've all heard, maybe we've all thought, we've all certainly known someone to say, why isn't the church today operating in the power of the Holy Spirit like they did in the book of Acts? Well, my first response to that is, the church is operating in the power of the Holy Spirit today. God is still healing. God is still setting captives free. God is still forgiving sin. God is still adding to the church daily those being saved. God is still moving. Now, the problem is, is that we live in an age where many feel like repentance is no longer a necessary component of the gospel message, and it's certainly not essential to salvation. And this is why there is so much powerlessness in much of what is called the church today. Listen, the gates of hell still aren't prevailing against the church. The repentant today are still walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And listen, that doesn't mean that you have to speak in tongues when you come up out of the water from being baptized or at the moment of your regeneration. That doesn't mean you have to speak in tongues or prophesy or any of these other things, even though that still happens today. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. People learn a supernatural language, come up from the water, speaking in a tongue that's unknown to them. But let me also remind you, and again, this is kind of a side note, the word for tongues always means to speak in a known language. It may not be known to the speaker, but it's a known dialect. It's not gibberish. It's not, she wrote a Honda, she wrote a Honda, she wrote a Honda or Yamaha or anything else. It's none of that. It's to speak in one of the dialects of the world that you instantaneously and supernaturally learn by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, there was a pastor one time at one of the uh, pastor's conferences out at Murrieta Hot Springs who stood up and gave testimony. One time he was on a trip uh, to Israel and he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would teach him how to speak Arabic so he could witness to some of the Palestinians when he arrived in Israel. When he got there at one of the stops, they got off the bus and there were some young Palestinians trying to sell their wares, maps or something to the tourists. And instantly this man shared Jesus Christ in fluent Arabic with this young man because God wanted him to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen, that's exactly what the gifts of, gift of tongues is. That's the purpose of its original uh, context when we study the book of Acts. Now I do think 1 Corinthians gives us a distinction in a language of prayer where one is praying to God, praying in the spirit in a language unknown to them, but it's still a known language. It's still a dialect. It's not some made up gibberish as I said. Boy, you're getting a lot of bonus points this morning. I... Now, listen, here's something else we need to take away from this. It doesn't mean when we're talking about repentance that God can only use the sinless. If he can only use the sinless, he can't use any of us. But the fact is, we need to recognize that repentance opens the door to the flow of power through us. And in Matthew eleven twenty, 20, think about this. Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not what? They didn't repent. Let me remind you of something else. We need to recognize that Jesus himself stated that he came to the Jew first. All of his engagements were primarily with the Jews. When he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he was teaching Jews. When he taught the Olivet Discourse, he was teaching Jews, even though there are some components of it, I believe, that are in reference to the church age. But Jesus' teaching engagements, he was teaching the Jews. He came to the Jew first. If you want to know what Jesus had to say to the church, he said something about the church concerning Peter preaching the first gospel message in the gates of Hades, not prevailing against it. He said, upon you, I will build my church. I think he was just referring to that Acts 2 sermon. But if you want to know what Jesus has to say to the church, you have to go to the book of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3. And he had this to say to the church at Thyatira in Revelation 2, 22 uh, through 24. He said, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and, prophetess, and by the way, Jezebel is just more of a title for the woman. It's not her actual name, most commentators believe. I mean, who would name their daughter Jezebel? Be like naming your kid Judas, right? Now, you allow that woman, Jesus is concerned about the teaching in the church. You allow that woman who calls herself a prophetess to teach 
and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. She was dragging pagan practices into the church. Now, Jesus said, I gave her time to do what? Gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds, their actions. I will kill her children with death. In other words, he was going to eliminate the Thyatiran church. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the mind and hearts. And I give to each one of you. Remember, he's talking to the church. I give to each one of you according to your works. The Lord cares about repentance. He wants us to repent and no longer live a life that reflects the pagan culture that we came out of. Jesus' words to Thyatira, his words against the cities of Chorazin, Tyre, and Sidon, and his earthly ministry headquarters of Capernaum should make it very clear that repentance is still a part of the gospel and repentance is essential to walking in Holy Spirit power. Amen? Now, one last point. We've still got plenty of time, so don't worry. Look at 8 through 10. And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now, Ephesus had a geographic location that made it the gateway between Europe, the Middle East, and even North Africa. And thus it was referred to as the treasure house of Asia. It was home to the temple to Artemis or the goddess Diana, as we know her. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was this temple that was fashioned for her. It had 127 60-foot tall marble pillars, and each pillar was laced with gold and precious stones. It had a beautiful mosaic ceiling, and just to give you some scope or idea, it was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. This huge canopy Alongside the temple carried a covered an area of 425 feet in length and 200 feet wide. It was an imposing place of idol worship. And therefore the temple was a center for fertility worship. And Ephesus therefore became kind of a collecting place for superstition, all the dark arts and cultic activity. Now, this is why Paul would later write to Ephesus. In Ephesians 6, 12, and 13, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the uh, cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to do what? To stand. Now, on his arrival, or after this encounter with these 12 men, Paul begins his engagement at the synagogue. And in Ephesus, he had one of the longest opportunities of any city preached for three months, reasoning, or the word can be translated as dialoguing with the Jews. And as usual, some believed, others were hardened in their hearts and rejected Paul's message about Jesus. Now, when persecution seemed to be imminent because of the past pattern of those who refused Paul's message, attacking him, seeking to stone or kill him, chasing him out of town and the other things we've covered in previous chapters, he rented a hall belonging to a local philosopher named Tyrannus. His name actually means tyrant. Now, one of the commentators, a man named Richard Longnecker, wrote of Ty Tyrannus, since it's difficult, except in bleak moments of parenthood, to think any parent would name their child tyrant, this is most likely a nickname given to the man by his students. So his students who sat under his lectures, saw the man as a tyrant. And Paul preached the love of God in the school of a tyrant for two years, leading to all who dwelt in Asia to hear the word of the Lord. Now, the reason we attach verses 8 through 10, even though there's a, there's a bit of a segue into our following verses 11 and beyond, 
is because we wanted to capture the context and arrive at this last truth, which is part of the empowering of the Holy Spirit that we all uh, enjoy. And it's just this. Listen, here's the last thing that is to be continued, not just in us, but through us. And it says, you ready? Listen, there will never be a better way to reach the world for Christ than preaching the word. There will never be a better way to reach the world for Christ than preaching the word. Now listen, whether you believe that the baptism of the spirit is distinct from the indwelling of the spirit, or if you believe that you get everything that you're going to get from the Lord as far as the Holy Spirit goes, at the moment you confess him as Savior and Lord, whatever your opinion is on that issue that is divided and causes discord in the church, your opinion on the issue isn't going to save a single soul. What's going to save people is preaching Christ and him crucified. And listen, this is a debatable portion of Scripture where many fine scholars had differed on the issue, but their landing place wasn't going to lead anybody to Christ. It was just going to establish their position on a matter of interpretation. Now, the truth is this from Romans 10, 9 to 13, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might get saved. What's it say? You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For, read it with me please, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we talk about the Jew and Greek here. We just read of the Jew and Greek. This is the culture, cultural Greek. This is not the ethnic Greek. Greek culture of the day, the high-mindedness and all the things we've talked about in previous chapters was a term used here because of the location and time. Now, in 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, Paul would also say this to Timothy in the last chapter of his last letter before his own execution. He would say to Timothy, I charge you, I put this responsibility on you, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, meaning whether it's popular or not, preach the word. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not put up with, that's the meaning of endure, sound doctrine. But according to their, what are the next two words? Their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they want to hear something, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, human fabrication. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Listen, church, saving faith comes by hearing the word of God. There's no other way to be saved. Every person who has come to faith in Christ has come to faith in Christ through the word of God. And listen, remember, Jesus is the word of God. Amen? Now, and therefore, since faith comes by hearing the word, the word is calling people everywhere to repent. You cannot separate the two things. Remember the word repent means to change the mind. And when you change your mind, your life changes too. So you can't separate living in moral purity or in the manner uh, that we have been called to live as Christians from repentance, as some try and do today. Listen, Paul was always preaching Christ and him crucified. And this is what institutes the change in people's thinking about Jesus. And he then begins to change their lives. Now, here's why this is so crucially important for us this morning. Being inclusive isn't going to save anybody. Being tolerant, as the word defines it, world defines it today, isn't going to save anybody. Being accepting of other religions, because that's what the world wants us to do, isn't going to save anybody. Listen, I don't know what it is, but all of a sudden, again, I've, these have been around for a long time, but all of a sudden, I'm seeing these ridiculous coexist stickers out there on people's cars. And they're stupid. And listen, if I offended you because you have one, uh, go out there and take it off. It's stupid. <laughs> 
Because the fact is we already coexist. They're not asking us to coexist. They're asking us to cohabitate. They're asking us to say Buddhism is equal to Christianity. They're asking us to say that Islam is equal to Christianity. They're asking us to say that the New Age movement is equal to Christianity, and we need to respect what other people believe just because they believe it. Well, listen, the Bible says that if you don't have Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're going to go to hell and you must be born again. Well, they don't have a place for Jesus that we have in our belief system. Islam may talk about Isa, the character that they named Jesus, but he is subservient to Muhammad. And listen, my Jesus isn't subservient to anybody. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And listen, if the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, you must be born again, if the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, I say fooey to coexist. I say follow Jesus and Jesus alone. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And this type of faith is a change of mind and therefore a change in your life. And there's no other way to arrive at saving faith than Christ preached and him crucified. Now, this is to be continued until the end of the age. And repentance of sin is essential to every Christian walking in power. John Corson wonderfully illustrated the principle some years ago, and I thought it was kind of a typical uh, John Corson. He said, you know, we're, we're equipped to be uh, conduits of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit to flow through us. He said, but sometimes our pipes are so full of junk that he can't move through us. So we have to clear the pipes out in order for the Holy Spirit to move through us. And the illustration was talking about the weights and sins that so easily beset and ensnare us. Listen, Christians growing in their knowledge of the word and increasing in Holy Spirit power is to be continued until Jesus comes for his church. And listen, maybe you're thinking, I don't know, this is pretty serious stuff you're talking about. Well, let me just tell you, I already signed us all up. We're going to be all in here. Amen? Amen. All in for the Lord. Full throttle, full speed ahead, whatever cliche you want to throw at it. But listen, we may as well jump in and start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit that is still available to us today. And whether you want to call it a second baptism or whether you want to say it's the end result of your initial indwelling of the Holy Spirit, wherever you want to put it, however you want to call it, we just need to do it and walk in his power and see him use us for his glory. Somebody say, amen. And Father, we are thankful for your word again today. Thank you for helping us through this uh, much debated passage. And Lord, may our takeaways not be one side or the other, but may our takeaways today be within the context of your word that we indeed need to repent of our sin, that your power can flow through us. And thank you, Lord, that even if we do sin after we're saved, you don't, as David prayed, take your Holy Spirit from us. We just hinder our usability. So help us, God, to repent that your power can flow through us freely. Help us all to be growing in the knowledge of your word and in the power of your spirit. And Lord, help us to remember with all the pressures in the world today that people aren't going to get saved in a new way because we're in a new age. People are going to get saved the same way they've been getting saved for millennia by hearing the word of God. So Lord, I pray for all of us that you not have us cower to the bullies of our day, but rather that we walk in power, the power of the Holy Spirit given to us to be witnesses even to the end of the age. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, it's an awesome time to be alive. Amen. Jesus is coming. We know that for sure. Could he come today? Absolutely, he could come today. That's why I think we need to understand the doctrine of the rapture is called or labeled as an imminent doctrine. In other words, it has no signs associated with it. Just one day and hour, the Lord is going to blow that trumpet and we're out of here. And we will forever be with 
the Lord. So since, and here's what I pointed out at first service, and I want to mention it to you. We are seeing the signs and the structure of things forming that are going to happen during the tribulation. I believe that because of the divine response, an earthquake and hailstones of fire destroying the invading armies of Israel, uh, into Israel, which are operating as a coalition, even now as we sit here today, that that puts it inside the tribulation period when God is pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. So if the coalition of forces named in Ezekiel are not just working together, but now beginning to act mil militarily together. And if many of them are on the northern border of Israel, the very direction the Bible says they're going to invade from, and this happens during the tribulation, that means the rapture of the church is nearer than when we first believed. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour. You do not expect him. Perhaps today, somebody say, Amen. Would you all stand?